Well, I want to thank uh, uh, all of the, the, this wonderful crew, and and of course uh, Patty in the uh, amazing breakfast. There's no question that the war had a tremendous impact on uh, on both of these men. Uh, interestingly enough, in 1939, Lewis was asked to write a book called The Problem of Pain. And it was because uh, the war had just broken out. In fact, it was published in 1940. And at first he didn't want to write a book on on, on suffering and pain, uh, but then he finally just agreed that he would write the book The Problem of Pain. And by the way, the reason Lewis ended up giving broadcast talks during World War II is that uh, the director of BBC uh, Radio, uh, read this book, The Problem of Pain, and he didn't even know who Lewis was, because this was first Lewis's first major sort of Christian book. And he said, I read your book, it's made a tremendous impression on my life, and I wonder if you'd be willing to give broadcast talks to the people of England uh, during the war. He ended up giving 40, uh, 28, 29 talks, and those are called the broadcast talks, which became mere Christianity. But the, it was this book that got that, that uh, writer to write to Lewis and say, uh, "Would you be willing to? Uh, would you be willing to uh, speak to our country during the, the Battle of Britain?" And that's when those broadcast talks were given during the, some of the, uh, the toughest times of the Battle of Britain from 1941 on to 1944. Lewis gave 29 talks. But this is the preface to the book, "The Problem of Pain." He says. Uh, no one can say this about me. He's wondering why I was chosen to write on this book. And he said, you've asked me to write on it. I don't consider an ex myself an expert in any way. So uh, uh, yeah, OK, so anyway, he said, yet for this very reason, there is no one criticism that cannot be brought against me. No one can say, quote, he jests at scars who never felt a wound. In other words, somebody makes fun of scars because they never had a wound. For I have never for one, no, he doesn't say I got in that bomb blast and I carry shrapnel on my body. He doesn't mention any of that, he, but notice what he does say. If any man is safe, okay, for I have never for one moment been in a state of mind to which even the imagination of serious pain was less than intolerable. If any man is safe from the danger of underestimating that adversary, I am that man. I must add, too, that the only purpose of the book is to solve the intellectual problem raised by suffering. For the far higher task of teaching fortitude and patience, I was never fool enough to suppose myself qualified, nor have I anything to offer my readers accept my conviction that when pain is to be born, and then here comes this moving part, when pain is to be born, a little courage helps more than much knowledge. A little human sympathy more than much courage. And the least tincture of the love of God more than all. I read that because, in a way, it gives you a little window into one of the stories of the marvelous that Lewis wrote. In the story of the marvelous, the Chronicles of Narnia, to the children that are brought into Narnia, they were given gifts before the great battle scene that they had to face. Uh, Peter was given a great sword. Uh, Susan was given a bow and arrow, an ability to shoot the bow and arrow. And Edmund was not there. He had already began to betray the, the other children, and he was with the Winter Queen. That's the part of the story. But one other person got a gift, and that was Lucy, who is really the hero of the Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, was Lucy. And guess what her gift was? A little tincture of ointment that if she uses this ointment, it will help anyone who is harmed. And remember, she does it in battle. First to Edmund. Edmund gets that tincture. 
But isn't it interesting, Lewis first thought of that image way back in 1940 when he wrote The Problem of Pain. I'll read that again now when you think of it that way. That this then becomes, you might say, a spark for what he will later do in a story of the marvelous. Little Lucy uh, has a little ointment that was given to her and it is would be an ointment of help. And here it is. The, it says, the only, the only thing I can offer my readers, he says, I have the only, uh, nor have I anything to offer my readers except my conviction that when pain is to be born, a little courage helps more than much knowledge, a little human sympathy more than much courage, and the least tincture of the love of God more than all. Uh, also, you can see the influence of Lord of the Rings on this, because you're going to see now that in the Lord of the Rings, one of the important gifts that are there uh, that are not under the control of Sauron, not under the control of evil, is the, the ability to have sympathy for those who are hurt. And if you know the Lord of the Rings, at the very, toward the very end and at various midpoints during the Lord of the Rings, Sam Gamgee, especially, and Frodo, show sympathy for even such a despicable character as Gollum. And maybe that's what Gandalf means when he says, even Gollum shall play a role in this story. And they showed sympathy to him, even at the very final scene. Uh, Sam Gamgee could have killed him with a sword because he had always been trying to kill them. And he didn't because he looked so sad and he looked so hurt. And so he had sympathy. Isn't that interesting? Lewis puts that in. Lewis, remember, has been listening to the Lord of the Rings, this story from, from Tolkien through all this period. So you can see the influence of Tolkien on Lewis and the influence of, of the war on these, on these men. They, they had seen suffering and therefore uh, they, uh, they both felt commissioned. Tolkien felt commissioned to write stories. Uh, okay, now, it, to begin with, though, today, uh, Tolkien did a great help for us in, in, a, in an article that he wrote that was published by C.S. Lewis, actually, in, in Oxford University Press, published a book that was a, a feshrift, a, a book in honor of Charles Williams. And Dorothy Sayers wrote a, a chapter in that book. C.S. Lewis wrote a chapter in that book called On Stories. Uh, and then... J.R. Tolkien wrote the most brilliant chapter in that book on fairy stories or stories of the marvelous, fantasy stories. And in that great chapter, uh, Tolkien uh, gives four essential marks of a great fantasy story or a great story of the marvelous, which are the kind of stories that Lewis and Tolkien, and we want to look at now, the, the, those kinds of stories. First is what he calls image making. What he, uh, what he calls the writer's ability to sub-create, to create, a, in a sense, sub-creation. There is creation in the world, and then a, a writer who's going to write a great story sub-creates. Such a story has its advantage of starting out with what, what, Lu, what Tolkien calls a resting strangeness. There's a strangeness in a great fantasy story, in a great story of the marvelous. Because in that fantasy aspect of the story, the strangeness, it's an arresting strangeness that's in that kind of story. For example, a wardrobe in a house that opens to a wood filled with snow. That's, a, that's what you call an arresting strangeness. Or a gold ring that has power even in itself, in the self of the ring, to deceive the one who wears it. Uh, and also a ring that wants to find its creator. We'll see that in Lord of the Rings. Or a wood forest, a huge forest of giant trees that will appear in Lord of the Rings that can move into battle by mystery against orcs and against Isengard's citadel of Saranen and win that battle. These giant trees, if you saw the movie, that's one of the best parts of the movie, are the Ents. These creatures, these trees that come to life, that's 
That's what a fantasy story can do, can have those trees come to life where they are alive and to come into battle. Uh, so that's the arresting strangeness that is the mark of a great story of the marvelous. Okay, you have to get used to that. Some people who want just sheer realism all the time say, I don't want all that. But if, you, if you're going to read these kind of books, you're going to want to have to be able to put up with that. The second feature is that insight. Now, this is very important. The second feature of a great story, according to Tolkien, is that insight and consciousness must happen in the story, in the story's characters, so that they can make decisions. Otherwise, you don't have a story. And that's why if the character, villain or hero, is insane, then there is no story. You don't have a story. You don't have an adventure story because the man is insane. So he isn't making decisions. By the way, remember the Pink Panther movies? I love the Pink Panther because I like Inspector Clouseau. But do you know the Pink Panther movies went downhill fast when Inspector Dreyfus became insane? Remember that? The last three Inspector Crusoe movies were ruined by an insane inspector who even when he saw Crusoe, he fell back because he was insane. And it ruins the story. There is no story if he's insane. You have to have sanity. That's why I don't talk about people being insane. People can be dangerous. And that's what you, you, you care about in asking about but if the story has an insane person in it, you can't have a story because the characters have got to be able to problem solve. So even your villains have got to be able to problem solve like your heroes have got to be able to problem solve. OK, Tolkien saw that. And so he puts that in three. Every great story has to have a sense of escape from danger. Real dangers. There's got to be a key ingredient in the adventure is the escape from prison. And I love the way Tolkien puts it. He said, it's escape from prison in order to go home, not desertion. Desertion means I, I don't know where I'm going and I don't care. That's the problem with a cynical story about somebody who just deserts the army. There's no story there. He deserts the army to what? To do nothing? Just to do what he wants to do? No, but to, to escape from prison in order to go home or to go somewhere, or because you want to do something with that, with that revolution or something. So escape has got to have a goal. And that's why he doesn't like cynical stories, where it's just desertion. And then finally, the fourth mark. And that one, you can look to the front page of your bulletin, because we put a direct quote from Tolkien on the fourth mark. The fourth mark is consolation. A great story has consolation. The greatest stories have consolation. That is the U catastrophe consolation that he used with Tol Tolkien used in sharing faith with J.R. with C.S. Lewis. He says, in our stories, we always have the sense of catastrophe. That makes a story. That's why we want to follow it. That's the real crisis. That's the real danger. That's the need for escape. That's the need for this these dangers. And then we need you catastrophe. We need something greater than the danger. It's almost like Romans 5, where sin increased, and believe me, sin can increase. Where sin gathers momentum, the grace of God increased more. That's St. Paul. He could have written a great fantasy story from that one sentence alone. Where sin increased, the grace of God increased more. That's the you catastrophe. Now, Tolkien explained that in this marvelous article uh, that was published uh, by Oxford Press on letters to Charles Williams, the tributes to Charles Williams. And here I'll read, I'll read what Luke Tolkien wrote. The joy which I have selected as the mark of a true fairy story, of a true story of the marvelous, merits more consideration. Probably every writer making a secondary world, see, that's what we talked with, a fantasy, wishes in some measure to be a real maker or hopes that he is drawing on reality. Hopes that the peculiar quality of this secondary world is derived from reality or flowing into it. In other words, if it's so bizarre and so out to lunch with any meaning at all, then you're not going to follow it certainly to the end. 
it's got to have some sense of reality. And Lewis called that a touchstone of reality. It has to have a touchstone of reality so that you can either flow into reality or get a marker that you can say, ah, yes, I can see this in life. See? All right. The peculiar quality, okay, no, let's say, if he indeed achieves a quality that can fairly be described by the dictionary definition as inner consistency of reality. You've got to have that in a great story. That's the problem with having an insane, an insane character. You don't have that inner consistency of reality. The peculiar quality of this joy in successful fantasy can thus be explained as a sudden glimpse of the underlying reality of truth. You've got to finally see something that's genuinely true. And that's true in a fantasy story, just like it's got to be true. It's true in the Harry Potter series, too. There, that's a great fantasy set of fantasy stories as well. There has to be this touchstone. Now, to, admittedly, going into Waterloo Station and walking through a, a concrete wall and getting on that train is a fantasy. But the train is like a real train. And it goes to where real people are. And real harm is happening. And real battles are being fought. And there is good versus evil. And everything is there. But, of course, you have to put up with that walking through the cement wall. Don't go to the Waterloo Station and try to do it yourself. You'll be very embarrassed. Uh, but the peculiar quality of the joy in successful fantasy can thus be explained as a sudden glimpse of the underlying reality of truth. The you catastrophic tale is the true form of the fairy tale. It's the true form. It's the best. It's, and its highest function is that. The joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe. The sudden joyous turn. You can almost hear him arguing with C.S. Lewis on the road to the Addison Walk. And he finally said to Lewis, you know, Lewis... Jesus Christ is that sudden turn. He's the one, the sudden glimpse of truth is that man. Isn't that amazing? So the joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe, the sudden joyous turn, and I, I love this line, is not essentially escapist or fugitive. It is a sudden and miraculous grace. It's the discovery of grace. In other words, love that's stronger than the sin. It's stronger than the evil. It can give, and then comes that line that, that Rene read to us. It gives to a child or a man who hears it. When the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat and lifting of the heart. I still can't read the final paragraph of Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, without crying. I probably won't read it today because I break out crying every single time. Isn't that funny? Like Lewis said, a good story, if you read it when it, when, it should be able to read 20 years later. And it should, be, it, it, should, it should always be a story that you want to read. And it should break, bring you to tears. The river scene in, in Huckleberry Finn with Mark Twain's uh, marvelous scene with uh, uh, Huck and Jim riding in the raft. I break out crying. It's a humorous scene. They're down on the raft and up come a, a boat and Huck is there and Jim is lying and the guys are slave hunters because they're going to catch slaves and sell them. And he said, hey boy, is there a slave on that boat? And then Huck, it's a wonderful scene from Mark Twain. Huck says, hey, misters, come and help me. My pappy's sick here. He's got the fever. Well, they think he's got smallpox. And so then they say, no, 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 boy. No, 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 you're going down the river. And then they throw him a $20 bill. <laughs> <laughs> that is a huge scene. It's totally funny. And then Huck feels very guilty. He says, I just can't tell the truth. I'm in such a trouble because I can't. I'm, I lie all the time, don't I? Yet he saved Jim's life from being captured. And that's Mark Twain. It's, it's a sudden turn of joy. But notice it's a sudden turn of grace. It's not desertion. 
is escape. Great stories have that, and, and Tolkien knows it. So when it happens, it gives to a child or the man who hears it, when the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat, and a lifting of the heart. Okay, Lewis and Tolkien wrote stories, and I'm going to do quickly <laughs> talk about a whirlwind tour of this monstrous story. That's what Tolkien called it. It is monstrous because it's so complete. I mean, there's so many different kinds of creation in this story that you have to cope with. You got dwarfs, you got elves that are immortal unless they die in battle, but they're immortal and wise. And then you got men that can be tempted. And then you've got uh, hobbits that are only four feet high. He makes that point that they're four feet high by human standards. And then you've got even a creature who's even shorter than the hobbits, whose name is Smegel, who becomes Gollum, who's like a spider-like person. Yet he can think. He's not insane. He's certainly preoccupied with the ring because he once had it and then lost it. And so that's all he can think of. In fact, Tolkien did ruin one word in the English language forever. Anybody who's ever read The Lord of the Rings can never use the word precious again. <laughs> Tolkien succeeded in destroying the word precious because that's all that Gollum calls it. My precious, my precious, my precious, my precious. The ring is precious. And so look, Tolkien, I have to, have to blast him for that. He destroyed a great word. I never liked that word anyway. But now <laughs> it's like, like Lewis says, I can't put my hand all the way over my head, but I never wanted to anyway. I never wanted to say precious anyway. And now I can't. Because anybody that's in the room that read Lord of the Rings will start laughing at me. Don't ever call your grandchildren precious. Oh, how precious they are. Don't do it. <laughs> you may have somebody in the room that read the Lord of the Rings. So anyway, they, we have two kinds of stories. They are both stories of the marvelous. Tolkien's is a pure myth, completely pure. There are no English children brought into, into Narnia. I mean, a, a, into uh, Middle Earth. Uh, and in a way, th th that's something where Lewis is different. Lewis brings English children into the picture. And he has a different kind of story than the marvelous. And so the one I want to look at in a minute, that hideous strength. They're just ordinary people in there, but yet it's, it's a story of the marvelous. It's, it's a fantasy story. But Lu Tolkien's is totally pure. There is simply uh, nobody except pe the creatures he creates that are in that story. And you have Gollum, and you've got this great Gandalf the wizard, the gray, and then he becomes wizard, the white. And you've got all these different creatures that are created. There is one catastrophic crisis at the core of this story. And by the way, many critics criticize Tolkien for this. I do not criticize him with it. I think it's right. They, a lot of critics at first criticized Tolkien. They said that the only catas the, the catastrophic center is one word. P-O-W-E-R, power. That's the word. Power. By the way, when I was a student at Cal Berkeley, I took a course in political philosophy, and I'll never forget, my, my professor was George Catlin. Actually, he was an Oxford professor who is now teaching at Berkeley. And I went to my final examination in, the, in that class at Berkeley, and my professor went to the wall and wrote, this is going to be for a three-hour final and wrote one word on the, block, on the chalkboard, P-O-W-E-R. Have a good time, folks. Write your, write your final. And I had to write a three-hour final in political philosophy on one word, power. Power. Wow, do we know a lot about that word. But it is the catastrophic center of Lord of the Rings. And some people said, well, why, is it more, why don't you nuance it more? and have this kind of power, that kind of power. No, just power. And that is it. And so let me just analyze it quickly. It's the power of immense strength and danger in the creation of Middle Earth by a good source. By the way, he does not have Middle Earth created by an evil source, like in some of the Gnostic uh, creation epics, where you have an inferior God creates, and therefore you have to have a superior God redeem us from a, an inferior creation. That's Gnosticism that was really bad in the second century. 
That's not the biblical picture. And, of course, Tolkien is so biblically sensitive there, he would not have ever. The creation in Narnia created by uh, an, an evil creator. The Illator creators of, of Narnia, when they create, they do create Valors and create those who are holy ones and they're, they're, they've got different names. I'm not going to go through all the names. <laughs> you can never keep track of all the names of Tolkien. But anyway, one of the Valars named Melkor, who gets, ends up getting several names, but Melkor is one of the Valars, was given the most strength. And that means, just like in the biblical account, you have creation, and we're all loved equally by God in his creation, but he gives us all different strengths. Isn't that interesting that in the epic of the book of Genesis, between Adam and Eve and their two sons, one of the sons was given strength, more strength than the other son. Cain was able to overpower his son Abel in the woods and kill him. It was his decision. It wasn't that he was made evil, but he was given strength that was greater than Abel. And that's the way, that's the way he chooses to start his epic account. One of the Valors was given more strength, more power than any of the others, and he quickly turns it to evil because he counters the Iltors, who are the creators, uh, the, the creator of good. And so that strength becomes the evil and becomes the catastrophic fact in, in the Lord of the Rings. That one, Melkor, uh, who defies the good source and therefore he's given a whole bunch of names by the time we get to Middle Earth. He's first called Mordor and then he's called uh, the Dark Enemy by the Elves and finally the Eye of Malice. I'll show you a picture of him, the Eye of Malice. I should have brought that up. So you can see it. The eye, Tolkien himself, who was an artist, decided to draw the eye of malice in the cover of his book. And if you went and saw the movie, the eye of malice is done magnificently in the Jackson movie. That eye, the eye of malice, the dark shadow. And that is, he's, by the time we get to Middle Earth, he's called Sauron. Sauron. Uh... And uh, actually, the, the, the story begins, uh, it begins with a poem that Tolkien gives us in the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, at the very beginning of, of the whole story, he gives a poem, which is an elvish poem. I'll read the poem to you. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords and their halls of stones. Remember, they're dwarfs. Nine for mortal men who are doomed to die, because men, you know, do die. They, they're not eternal like the elves. One for the dark lord on his dark throne, and that is Sauron. In the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. One ring to rule them all. Now, we find out that this Sauron was so strong that he was able to take the one ring he got of rings that these elves made, and he was able to refashion it in, in, in a forge and make it the strongest ring of all. It is the one ring to find them, the one ring to bring them all in the darkness and bind them in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. And that's the poem that really sets up the whole Lord of the Rings uh, epic. It's interesting, isn't it? You have that amazing epic power, and that is, the, that is the catastrophic center of the story. This powerful ring that is extreme, but it's not ultimate. Now, that's the interesting thing. It is not ultimate. It is boundaried. Now, let me just go quickly through the boundaries. It is boundaried in several ways by creation. First, the elves are not under the domination of the ring. The elves are immortal, and they only die if in battle, or if they become weary and lose interest in living. But otherwise, they live forever, the elves. They, they, as you can tell, Tolkien is more interested in the elves than anybody in the story. And they're wise. 
And then there are the valors who are empowering certain parts of the creation that are not under the power of Sauron. One are the trees. Okay, I made a reference to that, the ants. And so there's valors who protect the trees. They're not under Sauron's power. This is what makes a good story. If you have a story where he has power over everything, but no, there are some things he doesn't have power over. And they're going to make the story happen a lot more exciting to know that he doesn't have that much power, but he has tremendous power. And then there is the sea. The sea does not belong to Sauron. It belongs to a valor who protects the sea. And that's good to know. And then the mighty eagles. There are mighty eagles that don't belong. You're going to see when you, you break out crying at the end when those eagles come to rescue two little boys. Okay, the eagles. And then there are the covenants of courage for truth that are not yet fulfilled. And they are some ghosts in the valley of the dead who did not fulfill covenants they were supposed to fulfill during their life. And now Aragorn, the great the future king, is able to go into that valley of death and wake up those ghosts and say, you'd better come to battle now for truth. Or otherwise, you'll be here all the rest of your time. You'll never get out of here. A little bit of purgatory theology there. You'll never get out of here unless you fulfill your covenant. And so, you know, that great scene when these ghosts appear. And that is a it, it's great film work to be able to do that. These they finally decide to fulfill their covenant. So that's another thing, not under the power of, of Sauron. And, of course, there's a great Gandalf the Grey. This mystery guy, Gandalf, who is uh, a, a wizard. He's, like a, he's a man, but he's good, and he, and he stands for good. And he has these many, many close calls, but he's always in the thick of it. He's always in the thick of danger, yet he stands there as good. He's not a Christ figure. He's more like a prophet figure, but he, there he is. He's definitely not the redeemer. Tolkien does not confuse that at all. He's not at all. But there he is. And then there's a mysterious, there's a final mysterious valor, a valor of hope, uh, who is almost like a Holy Spirit valor, who is not uh, attached to trees, not attached to the sea, but is a valor who will help you and give you wise advice to keep you from temptation and restrain power itself in you and will help you have the courage to do that. And it's a little bit of Tolkien maybe flirting with a little bit of Holy Spirit theology that he just puts in to the Lord of the Rings. There is that valor that when you're in great dire distress can sometimes come and help you and assist you so that you know a truth and you see something true. And then now the ring itself uh, we need this. Sauron, of course, we've already introduced this. He's the one who made the powerful rings. And by the way, it's interesting. Remember, it says the nine rings for men. The nine rings for men were all rings of power. And it's interesting that Sauron took those nine rings and gave them to men. And the men used those rings and they had and they had success with the rings. But what you need to know about the rings is when you use the power of the ring, the ring ends up in ends up owning you. And it did to the nine men, the nine rings, the nine rings that were given to mortal men. Remember in the, in the poem, nine rings to mortal men. And the nine rings are given by Sauron to the mortal men and they use it with power. And what happens is those mortal men drift into shadowhood and they become shadow men. Guess who they are? The ringways. The terrifying ringways are men who are no longer men. They are shadows, but they are under the control of Sauron and they're his troops and they scare the daylights out of everybody. They should. The ringways. And then finally, one victim of the ring is a small hobbit like creature named Smeagol who had found the ring. And this ring he found was the, the one ring, the ring of all power. That in, in Silmarillion, you know that it was cut off the thing, it was cut off the hand of, of, of Sauron by, by a, a king at one point. And then the king took the ring and was being chased by orcs. And he went swimming in the water. And the ring deliberately fell off his hand. The ring has its own power. And then he was killed by arrows from the orcs and the ring lay in the bottom of the water. 
and was there for many, 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 <laughs> many thousands of, you don't know, he doesn't go into years. And then it was found by Smiggle, who was a fisherman. And then he had it. And then he lost it too, because the ring, you, it loses itself because it wants to get back to its owner. And then Smiggle ends up hating and loving the ring for the rest of his life. He must find it again because he's totally intoxicated by its power. Because the power of the ring is that it makes you invisible and no one knows where you are. And it gives you that invisibility power. But what happened to the men who were given the nine rings is they then became more and more invisible. And they finally ended up being shadows. And so the ring, if you use it, it gets power over you because it wants to go back to its owner. So anyway, the main adventure story, what is the adventure story of Lord of the Rings? It's got many, many sub-stories. But the big story is that two young men, Sam Gamgee, uh, Sam, uh, two young men end up, first uh, Frodo. Frodo is the nephew of Bilbo Baggins. And Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit found the ring. And he brought it back to the, to the Shire of the Hobbits. And he used it in a fun way to, go, to, to amuse his friends by it becoming invisible and stuff like that. But it also was taking a toll on his life and he was losing interest in living. Interesting. Bilbo Baggins was losing interest in living. And so finally realizing that and realizing I got to get away from this ring, he gave it to his nephew, Frodo. Frodo doesn't use it, doesn't know anything about it, but Gandalf the wizard, knowing that the ring is there, comes, alerts him to the danger of the ring, and shows him that this is the ring that's the great ring over all other rings and is the great catastrophic power. And he says to Frodo, uh, so Frodo says, well, will you take it then? And then Gandalf says, oh, no, I cannot take it. I would be tempted by it too. Even Gandalf can't take the ring. And so what are we going to do? He says, you've got to go over. They go to Rivendale where the elves are and they have a council. And it's decided that Frodo, he's the one that was last got the ring and no one else can do it. He's got to go to the to the temple, uh, to the mountain of doom, to the crack of of the forge where it was first made. And that's where the ring has to be thrown down and destroyed. And the whole story of Lord of the Rings, all three volumes are journeying with Frodo and his beloved friend Samwise, who wasn't even supposed to go with him, but just deliberately decided to go with him. And so Sam, so that Frodo said, okay. And then the non-friendly, uh, what, I, what I call the anti-journey friend who was with him, Gollum. They can't get rid of Gollum. So he's there too. And that makes the story really exciting. You've got these two young men with evil Gollum who's trying to get the ring, doing everything he can to get the ring, but he does lead them. Several times they spare his life. And that sparing his life, the fact that they showed grace means that they're not under the control of the ring still. If they were under the control of the ring, they would lose all sympathy with anyone, but they don't. And so that is another part of the story. Well, they have all the amazing things that happen. I'm going to read one temptation scene because it is so moving uh, where it shows you the power of the ring, but it also shows uh, the power of that good force that plays its role. In the Fellowship of the Ring, as soon as the council has decided that Frodo must take the ring and go to the, go to the, the, the Mountain of Doom to destroy it, uh, he goes out and uh, a young prince named Boromir, who's a good man who later is killed in battle with great bravery. But at this point, he's a young man, very muscular, very powerful young man, and, uh, and will eventually become a king, except he gets killed in a battle with the orcs. He comes up to Frodo and says to Frodo, first he's very friendly to Frodo, and he says, you know, Frodo, uh, really a strong person should carry this ring because a strong person, you're just a little four foot high, a four foot high uh, hobbit is not going to have any way of getting through all the things you have to get through. So you should let uh, me take the ring. And Frodo says, no, I'm given the ring. I'm supposed to take it. And so at any rate, uh, Boromir tries to reach down and grab it and overpower him because Boromir is a very powerful man. And he's going to take the ring. And then guess what Frodo does? Frodo 
knows that he can, go, that he can become invisible by putting the ring on. He puts the ring on his hand. He's invisible. And in that invisibility, then, Boromir then is now desperate and is crying and realizing, I did the wrong thing. I did the wrong thing. Please forgive me. But he can't. And he can't find him. And uh, 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 so... Uh, uh, so uh, Frodo has the ring. He's 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 safe, but, and because Boromir cannot see him, no one can see him. And then suddenly he felt the eye. Listen to this. He's now got the ring on, and we're seeing the power of the ring. He suddenly he felt the eye. There was an eye in the dark tower that did not sleep. He knew that it became aware of his gaze. He a a fierce, eager will was there. It leaped toward him, almost like a finger. He felt it, searching for him. Very soon it would nail him down, knew exactly where he was. And he glanced and, and he threw himself from the seat, crouching, covering his head with his gray hood. He heard himself crying out, never, never, or was it verily I come, I come to you. See what's happening? He is now being tempted to follow the ring and get get its power uh, so he first says never never or was it verily verily i come to you he could not tell then as a flash from some other point of power there came to his mind another thought take it off take it off fool take it off take off the ring and he does he does not end up captive to the ring isn't that amazing scene? That's the opening scene in the Fellowship of the Ring when Frodo has that terrifying scene and the power of the ring. First he's saying, never, never. But, or was he saying, verily, verily, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Because then he'll get more power. But he'll fade. And instead, he hears this voice. And this is Lewis is about as close as the Tolkien comes to the Holy Spirit coming into your life and saying, take it off, take it off. Repent, repent. Go away from this power. Take it off. Take it off. And so he does. Well, then the the, the journey begins, and they go uh, they go uh, through many many harrowing experiences. And I I won't read any more of the harrowing experiences of Sam Gamgee and Fro and uh, and young uh, Frodo. But they they end up uh, getting to the to the, the mountain of doom. They get to the crack where the fire is, and in a dramatic final scene, uh, the uh, the ring is destroyed. It's not destroyed though without a final tragic moment. A tragic moment when uh, Sam Gamgee and uh, who is the, who is such a great character in, in this, uh, and Frodo are there finally there in sheer exhaustion, and then the scene where. He almost kills Gollum because Gollum was trying so hard to get that ring. And then he has pity on Gollum. He doesn't kill him. And then Frodo comes up to the edge of the crack and decides to put the ring on and says, I have come on this mission to destroy the ring. I will not. I will keep it. And he stands there and like Sam Ganji, when he listens to him, hears him speak with a stronger voice than he ever heard from Frodo. I, I'll keep it. And just then, Gollum springs upon him. Fro Frodo takes the ring and becomes invisible. Gollum leaps upon him. And then it looks like there's a battle being going on. And he can't figure it out, except he finally hears the... the, the Gollum has razor-like teeth. And the razor-like teeth grasp the hand of the invisible... Go because the ring is not invisible. And Gollum gets the ring, my precious, my precious. And then he slips and falls into the chasm. And so the ring is killed. Gollum goes and, and Sam goes to his, to his friend uh, Frodo and says, you're safe. And now Frodo is back to himself. But th and then they wondered, they wondered what Gollum, what... Uh, Gandalf had said that even Gollum has a role to play. And he even played that role of, in his avarice, avaricious desire for the ring, 
goes to the ring. And so the ring is this. So it's an interesting mixture of stories that, that Tolkien puts together. And then, of course, in that final scene, uh, in the final scene, Sam Gamgee uh, are rescued. I'll read that rescue scene because it is so moving. I won't cry, I promise you. Uh, Mister cried uh, Sam and he fell on his knees in all the rain of the world. For the moment he felt only joy, great joy. The burden was gone. I'm glad that you're here with me, said Frodo. Here at the end of all things, Sam. Frodo and Sam could go no further. Their last strength of mind and body was swiftly ebbing. And so it was. They were there. Uh, the, if, if you saw the movie, they did, oh, the movie did this magnificently. Everything is crumbling because as the ring goes in there, there's now the destruction of the mountain of doom is going to happen. And there they are stuck on a little piece of land with this volcanic upheaval. And of course, down below where the soldiers are from uh, that, are, they, uh, that are trying to oppose uh, Saren, they can't realize, but suddenly all of the ring waves are vanishing because now the, the ring has been destroyed. So their power is gone. Everything is gone. And they don't know that, but the mountain is there and it's collapsing. And so here they are lying there in that tremendous scene. And then it shifts over to the great wizard Gandalf, who says, now the ring has been destroyed. Sauron is now destroyed. And then he calls the great eagles and the great eagles come to Gandalf and Gandalf says, you must now do your great task. And then I'll read this part. And so it was that Gwynar, the wind lord, one of the great eagles, saw them and with his keen, far seeing eyes, as down the wild wind he came and daring the great peril of the skies, he circled in the air. Two small, dark figures, forlorn, hand in hand, upon a little hill, while the world shook under them and gasped, and the rivers of fire drew near. Side by side they lay, and down swept Gwynir, and down came Landerval and Mendelore, the two great eagles, the swift eagle, the swift, the two, that means the three great eagles came down but not knowing what had befallen them. The wanderers were lifted up and borne far away out of the darkness and the fire. And that's the end of the story. At least the end of that great story of the, the defeat of this horrible power. Uh, and notice in the, in the power, it's the power that when you welcome this source of power, when you welcome power that has no compassion, it has no, it only is focused on power. It's only focused on control. You end up losing your own integrity, losing your character, and also you begin to fade. You begin to fade as a person. What happened to the uh, men, the nine, who had the nine rings, they ended up shadows, uh, what they call ring waste. Now, another story is the one that Lewis wrote. And that story is, again, a story of the marvelous. We're in debt to Lewis for his brilliant account of what he called, uh, 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 first, we're in debt to Tolkien for giving us the, the insight into the markers of a great story. And now we have a chance to look at Lewis's story. In 1945, he wrote the third space trilogy novi novel, and he entitled it That Hideous Strength. The th uh, three novels, first one was called Out of the Silent Planet, and then Paralandra, and then That Hideous Strength. And in, in that story, Lewis gave this preface to the story. He, uh, he described his goal, he described his goal in writing the story, and he put it, he put it this way, Lost the, uh, too many pages up here, but he he put he put his his goal in the story this way. He says, "This is a tall story about devilry, though it has behind it a serious point. 
In the story, the outer rim of that devilry had to be shown touching the life of some ordinary and respectable profession. I selected my own profession because my own is the only profession I know enough to write about. And so it's not, it's set in Middle Earth, it's not set in another uh, created planet or created place. Uh, a little bit like he did with that hitty, that out of the silent planet and Paralandra. He doesn't do that. It takes place in a small town in England called Edgeworth. And in that small village is a college. And then the catastrophic center of this story is that it is also a story about power. And it is the power that harms. It is very specific power, focused power. In The Lord of the Rings, it's mainly just power itself, its own sort of uh, raw danger of just power, of having power, and how it does uh, draw you and control you by itself. Here, uh, it's a power that is highly focused. And uh, Lewis, in effect, uh, spoke to this power in a, uh, in a lecture he gave in a lecture he gave in 1939 after the invasion of Poland. When, after Poland was invaded, Lewis spoke in Oxford and says in his book, in his uh, lecture, uh, Learning in Wartime, he's sort of making the case why these students should stay at their posts as students. He says, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. The cool intellect must work not only against cool intellect on the other side, but against the muddy mysticisms which deny intellect altogether. The learned life then is for some a duty, and at the moment it looks as if it's your duty, he says to the students at Oxford, 1939, right after the, the, the attack on Poland. And I like that interesting. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. And so in a way, that which he said in 1939, he puts into his story. This is a story of bad philosophy. It's a story of bad, muddy mysticism. And the, the, the catastrophic center of this uh, bad, uh, bad mystery and bad... Uh, uh, evil is the there is a myth it's a myth that they have created a small circle of men and one woman who are believers in a toxic myth that if the body of the druid magician Merlin could be unearthed and they discovered that his body is buried under the green that belongs to this college Edward. And if they can get a hold of that green and then secretly dig there and they'll get the grave of Merlin, they can revive Merlin. They believe they can revive him and bring him to life again. And then with that, they can have power over the whole earth. Now, that's their muddy mysticism. And uh, so that's what they believe. And that's a toxic myth. Only a small number, only about five people are in on the myth. Uh, one, by the way, if you're uh, readers of the Lewis stories, you know that one of them is Dick Devine, who is in Out of the Silent Planet as the devil figure in Out of the Silent Planet. He's now called Lord Feverstone in that hideous strength. But he's the same man, Dick Devine, who is a devil figure in the earlier story. So they feel that they can get that body and reanimate it. They'll have power. So they end up buying this college and getting power over the college. And what makes the story work, and I was really struck by this, what makes the story work, and also what makes Lord of the Rings work, is that it's not just a fascination with Sauron. In fact, Tolkien is not fascinated with Sauron. He's more interested in all these different sources of power that can oppose Sauron, and that's why he has so many adventures along the way. And then, of course, the power of the ring itself, which is really almost separate from Sauron. It's and that why it has to be defeated. But so but he's very interested in all these other powers that are not under the control of Sauron, which makes the Lord of the Rings so exciting. Now here, the same thing. Lewis is not interested in that little clique, that little inner circle that have made this have got this 
uh, muddy mysticism, which they're operating on, which is built on that myth that if we can get a hold of that body and reanimate it, and then we'll have power over all the earth. But what makes a story work is that this story doesn't, does not feature on that inner circle. It features on one young scholar. Notice Lewis said, at the edge of this evil, at the edge of it is, uh, notice, the serious point of the story is the outer rim of the devilry. The outer rim. And I selected my own profession as a professor because it's my own profession I know enough about to write about. It's a little joke. So he has a young man named Mark Stoddard. He's estranged, a little, right now estranged from his wife, Jane. But his wife and he are, are not li too happy together. But they're, they're married. And he then gets totally caught up in this, uh, the, the, in the institution that this group of people have established. They've established an institution called the National uh, Institute of Cooperative Re uh, Experimentation. And so the, the acronym for that is NICE. And so that is the institution that they've established, the uh, National Institute for Cooperative uh, Experimentation, NICE. And they, get, uh, they have governmental approval. Uh, they've got the approval of uh, the government to do this research. Uh, they have been able to gather tremendous amounts of money from wealthy people who want to support this research. And so they were able to buy most of the property of the, of the school. They were able to establish their own police force for NICE because they need to protect it from uh, people from outside that might come and want to ex uh, interfere with the experiments. No one really is... Uh, 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 clear as to what the experiments are, but they're happening in this, so they have a, a center that they, a house, a big mansion they own, and, but right away, what happens is, and Lewis focuses on this almost exclusively through the novel, and it's what makes this novel so exciting, I think. What we're going to do is to see how one young man is bent, how he is bent toward, or tempted toward this evil, and it happens in small stages. I'll give you an example uh, from uh, just in stage one, uh, uh, where, uh, where we first see sort of the power of this uh, devilry. And that is, Mark is a young f uh, fellow in the school, but he's not very high in the faculty. He's considered kind of a, a, low, a low rung scholar. And so there's a the dinner. And at the dinner, Curry is speaking to him, his, the, who is the sub-warden. He seeks out a confidential conversation with Mark Studdard. That was kind of impressive to Mark. And so uh, he uh, says to him, uh, yes, says Curry, it'll take a hell of a time. Probably go on after dinner this meeting. We shall have to all the obstructionists wasting time as hard as they can. But luckily, that's the worst they can do, he says to Mark because they're having a meeting about selling the property to Nice. Uh, you should never, you would never have guessed, this is Lewis, this is the narrative in the story, you would never have guessed from the tone of Mark's reply what intense pleasure he derived from Curry's use of the pronoun we. So very recently he had been an outsider, watching the proceedings of what he called then Curry and his gang, and this is Curry, the sub-warren, who's speaking to him now, of Curry and his gang with awe and with little understanding and making at college meetings short, nervous speeches, which never influenced the course of events. That's the way Lewis is, describes this young man, Mark. Now he was inside, and Curry and his gang had become we, or the progressive element in the college. It had all happened quite suddenly and was still sweet in his mouth. Oh, he loves it. And then it's interesting. Uh, the next marker in his decline, though, is when the subwarden introduces him to one of the senior members of both Bracton and Nice. He's Lord Feverstone. Now, we know that's Dick Divine. He's the, at the very core of this group. And he was uh, Dick Divine. The subwarden tells Mark, you know, he got you your fellowship. This discovery is troubling to Mark since he had thought that his own superior scholarship had won him his college fellowship. And as for Mark himself, he is, in fact, diminished by this new awareness. He now knows that Feverstone had known him, 
And he was the one who invited Mark on the inside circle of nice. He then is indebted permanently to Feverstone in every professional sense. Mark's captivity is now underway. And these new nice leaders are powerful shapers of his destiny. And from this point on, we notice that Mark, though he feels himself an insider, is personally put on the edge. Nothing is made clear to him, not even the actual amount of his salary that he says he's going to get. They, they hinted about a huge salary, but they never actually mention it as such. Then the first thing they do is he's a sociologist, so they give him an assignment to write a sociological paper about Edgestone, this town. And he writes it and he works on it for about three days. But when it comes out, he notices that a number of his details in the story have been changed and doctored. And they're not the report he wrote. So, but then he's explained, but you know, we have to really get this right so that we can win this approval. So he finally caves into that, even though it's not the report he wrote, but it's under his name. So now uh, he's uh, having this happen. And then, uh, and then, uh, and, and then the, the next big, big decline in his character occurs when uh, they decide that uh, they want to have a story uh, that'll appear in national newspapers about a riot that's happening in Edgestone because they need to have that riot in order to fully strengthen their police, and so they're going to they want an article and they want. He, he and several others to write an article uh, as a news report on a riot that's occurring in Edgestone so that they can justify beefing up the police force. And uh, then they tell him uh, at the meeting, and by the way, we need, to, uh, we need to have this article in our hands by seven o'clock in the morning. A, and <laughs> so uh, he's has to write this article about seven o'clock in the morning. And so the stuff must be ready to appear in the papers the very day after the riot, said Miss Hardcastle. This means it must be handed to the de deputy director by six o'clock in the morning at the latest. And, but how are we to write it tonight if the thing doesn't even happen till tomorrow at the earliest? Uh, Mark said that and everybody burst out laughing. You will never manage publicity that way, Mark, said Feverstone. You surely don't think you need to wait for a thing to happen before you tell the story of it, do you? <laughs> Talk about fake news. But, well, I admit, <laughs> he wrote this in 1945. Why I had, by the way, you know what I, I feel that to, the background for this was that the Crystal Night riots in Berlin happened in 1938, uh, and, and they were orchestrated by the uh, by the Gestapo and those riots were under the the, the guise that a, a German uh, officer in the embassy in France had been killed and so then this the purpose of the riots were be uh, people were just outraged at the killing of that embassy people but the, all the riots at Crystal Night were orchestrated by the Gestapo and 118 Jewish synagogues were burned to the ground during that night of riots but they were all planned by the Gestapo. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was totally staged. And, it was, and, and they had staged it all before it even happened. And then of course, they went to the world press and said, these riots happened, we're very sorry about that, but that's what happened. And so, so Mark says, well, I admit, Mark said, his face still was full of laughter. I had a faint prejudice for doing so, waiting until after the riots before I wrote the article. And, but he's to write the article about the riots before the riots even happened. Then Lewis, is, uh, as a writer and novelist, writes this. This was the first thing that Mark had been asked to do, which he himself, before he did it, clearly knew it to be criminal. But the moment of his consent almost escaped his notice. Certainly there was no struggle, no sense of turning a corner. There may have been a time in the world's history when such moments fully revealed their gravity, but for him, it all slipped past in a chatter of laughter, of that intimate laughter between fellow professionals, which of all earthly powers, listen to this great line from Lewis, which of all earthly powers is strongest to make men do very bad things before they are yet individually 
very bad men. In other words, see something happen and then don't report on it. Or to write something before it even happens and it isn't even happening. But you write it and that way you can justify the action which Nice wanted to have happen, this institute happen. And I'm, I, when I wrote uh, my own commentary on this great epic story by Lewis, I wondered if it wasn't that Crystal Knight was in his mind because they're there to write about a riot, just like the Gestapo had the whole thing written up and planned before it happened. And then, then a strange thing happens. Uh, one day, uh, one of the members of, the, of, the, of NICE comes up to him and says, my friend, he says to him, they wanted him to invite Jane to come and live in the, in the mansion with him because he's now living in the mansion. Jane is actually living in a, in a, in a kind of a retreat center called St. Anne's House. Uh, and, uh, and fortunately, she's there being protected by these folks that are, that are uh, believers that are very alarmed at what they see happening. But look, my friend, the real question is whether you mean to be truly one of us or with us. Uh, I don't quite follow, said Mark. Do you want to be a mere hireling? But you've already come in too far for that. You are at a turning point in your career, Mr. Studdock. But of course I want to come in, said Mark. A certain excitement was stealing over him. The head thinks that you cannot be really one of us if you do not bring your wife here. And the remark was like a shock of cold water in Mark's face. And yet, and yet. And he can't get his wife there. He fails. He tries to, but he can't get her there. And by the way, at the end of the story, you realize that they only went for Mark because it was the wife they were after. Because they knew that his wife was having mysterious dreams about Merlin. And they wanted her so they could tap those dreams and explore those dreams. And that's the only reason they had they got him in the first place. And now he, he won't bring her there. And so he, and he doesn't succeed in doing it either because she's being, in a sense, protected by the people at St. Anne's house that are protecting her. And then finally, in one final scene, we get a moment of truth and we get a breakthrough and we are grateful for this in the story. Uh, at, the final, at the final scene, where they are going to have a great banquet and they think they have Merlin, but they don't have him. They think they have him. And it, it, it's just a tramp they found near the grave and they thought that was Merlin. And so they even hire someone to come and translate ancient Latin from him. And the guy who doesn't know anything, he's just a, a tramp. But the person they hire is the actual Merlin. So that's where the story becomes the fantasy story. And Merlin is there in the banquet as the translator for this guy. And then I won't tell you the end of the story because it ends in a kind of Tower of Babel uh, holocaust at the end for this movement. But just before that banquet happens, they decide they're going to take Mark and make him a member of the inner core, figuring that he's safer if he's in the inner core than if he's now out loose because they can't get his wife in. So he goes and they have a, they have a ceremony. And he's to do this ceremony. And in the ceremony, they have created, he has never seen it before, but they have put on the floor a, uh, a wooden, uh, a kind of a wooden montage of Jesus Christ on the cross and in wood. And then they're to walk on this. And, and in walking on this, they, they become a member of this devilry movement. So he, they brought him there, and they show it to him. And then he says, what are you waiting for, Mr. Studdock, says Frost. He, he looks at it, and he says, now, Mark is not a Christian in this story. He, he, he'll see in a minute, this becomes a kind of a, a conversion experience for him. But uh, Mark was well aware of the rising danger. He was himself, he felt, as helpless as the wooden Christ. As he thought of this, he found himself looking at the crucifix in a new way neither as a piece of wood nor a monument of superstition, but as a bit of history. Christianity was nonsense, but he did not doubt that this man had lived and had been executed thus by the Belbury of those days. He saw that what happened in the, in the crucifixion of Jesus was like what was happening at Belbury, because they were, they were eliminating people at Belbury, and he saw it happen. It was a picture of what the crooked did to the straight, so now you can see it's crooked evil that Lewis is mainly concerned with here. It is, in a more emphatic sense than he had yet understood, a cross. 
Do you intend to go on with your training or not, said Frost. And I was on, his eye was on the time. But this raised a question that Mark had never thought of before. Was that the moment at which to turn against the man? If the universe was a cheat, was that a good reason to join its side? Supposing the straight was utterly powerless. See, now all the great themes Lewis is bringing together now in this start of the fantasy story. Supposing the straight was utterly powerless. Always and everywhere certain to be mocked, tortured, and finally killed by the crooked. What then? Why not go down with the ship? He began to be frightened by the very fact that his fears seemed to have momentarily vanished. Up till now, he's been doing so many things because of fear. A fear of that they might, not, they might exclude him and not allow him to be on the inside. They had been a safeguard. And they had prevented him all his life from making mad decisions like the one that he was now making as he turned to Frost and said, it's all bloody nonsense and I'm damned if I'll do any such thing. And he won't do it. He won't walk on this wooden Christ. And then at the final nice banquet scene that's going on at that very moment, the real Merlin is there. And the real Merlin Create, then a create chaos occurs and people pull out guns and start shooting each other <laughs> and uh, but Merlin makes sure that uh, the, the tramp who was there just by chance because they found him and thought he was Merlin who Merlin is so Merlin protects the tramp and protects uh, Mark Stuttered and they get out and the, and the whole thing goes down and collapse there is a it is a complete catastrophe in that in that scene, in that hideous strength, as everything goes up in flame. But Mark gets out, as does the tramp. Merlin rescues him. And then Mark goes over to the house, St. Anne's house, where he finds, uh, where he finds uh, the, uh, an attendant there who tells him to go into the room and stay there and wait in the room. And, and then they'll bring Jane to him. And then the scene shifts to Jane uh, as she then uh, has that final encounter uh, with uh, Ransom, who is, again, known from that hideous, known from out of the Silent Planet and Perlander, Ransom, who has uh, been in charge of St. Anne's house, a place where she has been protected. And, uh, and he says to her, and these are the last words uh, uh, before Ransom leaves and he says your husband is waiting for you at the lodge you will find love you will have no more dreams have children instead and then he sends jane over to find mark and that's the end of the story uh what lewis has done then is that in the, in this story he has sketched in the dynamics of what uh, are the ways of temptation and the ways of bending, how people can be bent. And the sudden turn of joy that marks these greatest moments in the story, uh, in a story of the marvelous happens. Uh, it's interesting. It happens in that hideous strength in a very, in a kind of a very down to earth way. Because when, when she finally comes over and finds Mark, she goes over to find him after Ransom tells her to go over and find her, find Mark. Says that uh, you'll no, have no more dreams, have have children instead. And he goes over there, and she now comes over, and she sees the door is open in in the lodge where he is staying. Because he he came sheer in total exhaustion from the, the the amazing encounter that he had had, you know, and at the end of, it, of that hideous strength story. And now if Mark were not there after all, a great gap of relief or of disappointment, no, no one could say was made in her mind by that thought. Still, she did not move the latch. And then she noticed that the window and the bedroom window was open. Clothes were piled on a chair inside the room so carelessly that they lay over the sill the sleeve of a shirt, Mark's shirt, even hung over down the upside wall. And in all of it, 
This, it was damp too. And then this is the last line of the story. How exactly like Mark, obviously it was high time she went in. Uh, he, he, had his, he had his clothes all over the room, but ah, uh, he's there. And so that's the way Lewis decided to end the story. Uh, just a sort of a simple story, leaving it all in your hands. What do you do with when you discover that you were tempted and you, you, you are not yet a, a really bad man, but you're doing things that if you keep doing them, you'll become a really bad person. And that was happening to Mark. And then there was that amazing moment. It was sort of a kind of a catastrophic moment when Frost is trying to get him to to join in the inner circle and walk on this wooden Christ, and he decides he can't do it. Uh, I love these kinds of scenes where you get the eucatastrophe scenes. Uh, the one I just read to you from the Lord of the Rings, and then even that simple meeting of Mark and, and Jane uh, at the end of it. Uh, also in screw tape letters. Now I want to read you one more reading. In the screw tape letters that Lewis wrote uh, in 1940, a lot of people think of screw tape letters as a, a very, very humorous, and it is a very humorous book. I always urge people, if you're just starting out in reading in Lewis, start with screw tape letters. And if you're, and of course, the Chronicles of Narnia. And see Lewis just relaxing. He, you know, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia starting in 1950. He wrote screw tape, screw tape letters in 1940. And he makes the character in screw tape letters a soldier, a soldier in the war. And that's who gets tempted by a junior devil named Wormwood. And a senior devil, screw tape, is supervising all that temptation. And in the process of this wonderful little book, this, the patient, he's called the patient, falls in love. The worst kind of love, because it was uh, people who didn't even appear in the dossier that the devil had. And then he gets to know that woman's whole family. Uh, couldn't you see that was the room he should never have left that has a, that terrible smell? Remember Lewis, uh, St. Paul says there is the aroma of grace. And that smell, even the gardener has begun to catch it from this house. So he shouldn't be there. And that's a wonderful humorous scene uh, as we meet this patient as he falls in love. But the last letter in the screw tape letters is in light of Lewis's own experience in the war, is the patient out in, in the battle and a bomb hits him and kills him. So you think screw tape letters is funny as it is all the way through. But then the final scene in screw tape letters is the killing by war of this young patient. And this is the way Lewis is describing it. Remember now, screw tape is is hearing it from Wormwood and says, as he saw you, he also saw them. I know what it was. You reeled back dizzy and blinded, more hurt by them than he had ever been hurt by bombs. The degradation of it all. That this thing of the earth could stand upright and converse with spirits before whom you, a spirit, could only cower. Perhaps you had hoped that the awe and strange enough at all would dash his joy. But that is the cursed thing. The gods are so strange to mortal eyes, and yet they're not strange. He had no faintest conception of, that's this, of what this very hour would look like. And he even doubted their existence. See, what's happening is the patient is meeting these people, these angels, these friends. I remember, the, the, uh, you're wondering if Lewis is reflecting on the on the community of saints in the chapter 11 and 12 of Hebrews. And he had no faintest conception of this very hour of how they would look and even doubted their existence. But when he saw them, he knew that they had always known them and realized what part each one of them had played at, the, at many an hour in his life when he had supposed himself alone so that now he could say to them one by one, who, not who are you, but so it was you all the time. And all that they were and said at that, this meeting woke memories. The dim consciousness of friends about him, which had haunted his solitudes from infancy and now at last explained. That central music in 
every pure experience, which had always just evaded memory, was now at last recovered. Recognition made him free of their company almost before the limbs of his corpse came quiet. Only you were left outside. He not only saw them, he saw him. This animal, this thing begotten in a bed, could look on him. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him, is charity itself, and wears the form of a man. And that's the way Lewis portrayed that amazing, eucatastrophic death scene in Screwtape Letters. A lot of people don't realize that death scene is there. And I love that line, oh, so it was you all along. It was you that were there. He recognized the, the saints. And then he saw him. It's amazing. Lewis puts that in his story and makes that the sort of you catastrophic moment in screw tape letters. I didn't want you to miss that. That was there too. Hey, I'm now going to stop and uh, we do have a chance for some dialogue for a few minutes and we have microphones that will go around. And so what you need to do if you want to ask a question or make an observation that you'd like me to reflect on. And by the way, we filmed this whole morning is being filmed. And so if uh, you get a mic, raise your hand and we have, there's a mic and there's a mic. And, and then you'll be on camera too, because they'll, they'll, they'll swoop in on you and not, not really, they won't move in on you. But if you have a question or comment that you want to ask as we come to the close, uh, raise your hand and, uh, either Zach or Renee will go to you. It's a race. I, I won, Zach. I have a question right here. Yeah, and just speak up and then do your best. If you wrote your question on a qu paper, that'll help you write it. read it. I'll, re I'll remember it. Um, so it seems like you were awfully hard on insane people today, <laughs> uh, particularly in terms of it as a, a storytelling device. And I know you're also a big Dostoevsky fan, so what I was reflecting on when you said that is... Uh, Part of the element of the, the story Crime and Punishment is how Raskolnikov, the character, essentially goes insane after he commits his evil deed and has to, to come to grips with that and kind of come out of that. And so isn't it true that sometimes mental illness or insanity can serve as a powerful storytelling device as well? Yeah, of course, I, I don't think uh, Raskolnikov becomes insane. I think he has this tremendous psychic shock, but he always makes decisions He's still always making sure that uh, he's not caught. And, and then he's able to fall in love. And he is able to hear. Uh, so I don't call that insanity at all, especially when Sonia says to him, you are a murderer. She gave the word of truth to him and he did not deny it. And, and now he does something that we would call strange. She says to him, you must kiss the earth and you must say to the north, east, south and west, I am a murderer. You must say that. And so he does. Now, we would call, man, that guy must not be in his right mind to say it. And, of course, nobody believes what he says except Petrovich, the detective, who has been following him all along. He's like Columbo. He knew that he was guilty, but he was. And then don't forget what makes, Raskol, what makes the crime and punishment work is that he's then sentenced to Siberia prison. And who follows him to Siberia but Sonia? keeps him alive, and then the final scene where she gives him the New Testament and he reads about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And again, she, notice what he says to, her, to himself. I wonder if her thoughts can become my thoughts. Those are not the words of an insane person. Those are the words of a thinking person. Uh, but he does have psychic shock. And I'm not going to call that psychic shock insanity. I'm just saying if the whole story is built upon insane uh, non-decision making, they're just completely under the captivity of something, then you don't get a good story because you have, you, you have nothing to work with. It doesn't want to, you know, it doesn't hold you to the end of the story. And, and again, that would be certainly true of, of Crime and Punishment. That's one of the greatest of all novels for sure. And you're right. There is that after the killing of the, the two women, 
He hadn't intended to kill one of them, only one. Then he ends up killing two. And he, he is in terrible shock from that. Yeah. Why in Tolkien's work, in Lord of the Rings, are women so absent? Uh, now, what in Tolkien's work? In Tolkien's work, the Lord of the Rings, why are women so absent? I, I still don't know what you want the motivations part of that sentence. Can you say it very, very loud? Why in Tolkien's work are women absent? No women. In, there, there are some, but there's not a whole lot of women in Tolkien's literature. I, I'm still... Get it again to me one more time. What in Tolkien's work? Women. Huh? Oh, what role women play in Tolkien's work? Yes. Uh, Tolkien, uh, of course, loved his daughter Priscilla and they loved his wife. But it's true that uh, he was very male, friendship wise, throughout his whole life. And he did not want any women in the, in the Inklings group. Uh, and, and it is true that, as you read my article, when Lewis uh, married Joy Davidman, he at first was really troubled by that because he didn't trust Joy Davidman. That was a big mistake on Tolkien's part. By the way, can I tell you something interesting there? Uh, Tolkien was uh, miffed, like all of Lewis's friends were miffed by Joy Davidman. Uh, because they thought, they, they just didn't, they didn't give her a chance. And she was a New Yorker, she had a salty New Yorker accent, and she didn't fit into Oxford. And she didn't like Oxford, particularly. And, uh, Guess who else did not like Oxford? Edith Tolkien. Because Edith Tolkien only had a, a very small education uh, profile. She was a, a teacher's helper in a school when she married J.R. Tolkien. And they raised these wonderful four children. And Edith Tolkien uh, never liked going to the cocktail parties and the, the scholarly parties because everything was where'd you go to school what, what are you studying now and what's your this and what's that and everything was in a high uh, kind of a pedigree type thing and guess who reached out to joy davidman when tolkien himself uh, it was sort of kind of writing her off at first until he met her in the hospital and then tolkien changed his two and two but it was his wife edith who reached out to joy davidman now she had a soul partner. She didn't like Oxford, and Joy Davidman didn't like Oxford. And it's interesting, when Tolkien retired, they immediately moved away from Oxford against Tolkien's will, and then she died, and he immediately moved back. And uh, he loved to be with men's groups, and, and it's true. And, and it, maybe that does affect his storytelling. Yes, men are playing a key... Those, the girls and the women in the Elfland. And remember, Elfland is the people he likes best. And their women in Lord of the Rings play the bigger part. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm glad you raised that, though, because that is true. You could call it a blind spot in Tolkien. I don't know if it's a blind spot as much as, uh, again, his decision in the way he created uh, the story. The, the women just don't play a part. In, in, the, in the Hobbit world, they don't play a part in the dwarf world, they don't play a part in the human world, except for Aragorn, who falls in love uh, with, with a wonderful woman. In, uh, but the, in the elf land, they play a big part. And remember, the elf world is the most important world for Tolkien. Hey, good. Sorry, I had a hard time hearing that first concept. Hey. Uh as a woman, I, I'm not going to argue that point, but uh, I struggle. In fact, I ask you this practically every day. What can I learn from Tolkien and Lewis as an ordinary individual to stand up to power when I see it do harm yes. without becoming and doing harmful things myself. Right. You know, I, I do give great tribute to uh, the, the subtlety in Tolkien. Uh, how can I stand up to power when it's wrong and, and without becoming myself embittered and, uh, and, and do harm in, in standing up to harm? You know, 
the subtlety of Tolkien putting in that, that valor of encouragement, the valor who comes up to you and does encourage you to, to you read in Silmarillion when he's described, or she is described, because it's not given a sexual connotation, uh, that when that voice comes to protect you from despair and protect you from temptation, those are two things that it protect you from, and then to make you sympathetic. Those are three things that that gift is given to you. And those that sympathetic sympathy for the, for the wounded, uh, uh, resistance to temptation, like get out of there, get out of there, get out of there, that is coming from that, that wonderful voice that he puts in there. So you don't have just the power of, that can be so complete. But it is true. Tolkien is in that way very, in, in, very emphatic that if you start to uh, welcome the ring's power, you will end up belonging to the power. The power will, it will take away your ethics. It will take away your, uh, like Lewis has that great line, so you, you maybe not yet a bad man, but you're doing bad things that will make you a bad man or a bad woman. If you give in to power and don't stand up to it when it goes against truth and goes against kindness, goes against goodness, and those are the great verities. Uh, in fact, the, the, many people feel that's the big advice that Gandalf gives to Sam Gamgee and to Frodo. Be sure, as bad as Gollum is, that you don't, uh, that you don't kill him and don't do harm to him. Uh, he may play, he's playing a role. He has a role to play and the story's not over. And that sort of story's not over is a big theme in, in, that, uh, in that, that valor of encouragement. The valor of encouragement does not belong to, to Sauron. He has no encouragement at all. He only, has, he only has a desire to control. And that, by the way, the ring controls Sauron too. See, the ring has its own power. It's a kind of a strange picture of power that the ring deliberately gets lost in the, in the river when it was, and yet it doesn't get deliberately lost from, from Frodo because they don't use it much. And if they use it, it will gradually get control of you and take you off. And then it'll, it'll go off your hand and go to somebody else. And that's the power, the, 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 you might say the, the, the tragedy of that kind of power. And, uh, but Lewis helped me a great deal in that hideous strength. I wrote a paper on that hideous strength because I was so struck with the fact that I think Lewis was definitely affected by what he saw happening in Nazi Germany where uh, kind of the muddy mysticism of, of a kind of cultic, racist uh, mysticism in Germany uh, was featured always almost in mythic proportions so that we know that the SS were doing experiments on the brain and the size of the brain, trying to prove that the Nordic brain was more powerful than uh, brains from other racial groups, saying that this is the superior race and we have superior studies and we're doing them. And Lewis was fully aware of that, that they were doing these racial studies to prove that we Nordic people are the ones who should be the rulers of the earth. And you can see that's what's happening in, in the, that hideous strength. They feel if they can get a hold of Merlin, Merlin will give them the empower to, be, to have control of the earth. And that is the, and, and then of course, but I love the fact that he has the temptation at the edge. It's the edge of devilry. Like a little thing, like just wanting to be on the inside, want to be in the in circle. And then you end up doing bad things to get in with the in circle. You, you, you don't want to, uh, if, if you're getting political advantage by supporting somebody who is doing evil things, but they can give you advantage in your policy or goal that you have, then you put up with the evil that's happening because you're getting something from it. And that is what's happening in that hideous strength. Now, Tolkien doesn't do it in that subtle way because you can't bargain with the ring. Now, that's, and that makes it a weakness in the story. Some people noted that weakness. The ring is not, you can't bargain with it, so it doesn't have as much interest as to toy with the kind of power the ring has. You can't argue with the ring. The ring has that terrible power. And it, the only thing you can do is not use it. If you use it, you lose it. 
you use the ring's power, and it is power, then it will control you, and you'll become a ring wraith. Uh, you know, those, those shadow men that terrified everybody because they were the main soldiers of, of uh, Sauron. But it wasn't that they belonged to Sauron. They belonged to the ring. The ring took away their ability to be men. And now they're no longer men. They are fading. And by the way, Gandalf, when he talks to Frodo and warns him about the ring, Gandalf says, don't use it or you'll lose interest in living. You lose interest in living. It's what happened to Bilbo. You lose interest because the ring will have taken away that. It's turning you into a shadow. It will turn you into a shadow. And, you know, I think that is a great mythic lesson that everyone needs to learn in, in, in the world of politics and in the world of religion. Don't adopt a, a, a theme that gives you power uh, and use it. Even though say I can get my thing passed, I can get what I want done and or my religious goal can be achieved by this. But if I'm using a dishonest or a, way, a, a, a method that disrespects and doesn't obey uh, the great love commandment, which is the commandment that it's interesting, isn't it? That great commandment I preached on the last Sunday, that great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God is all soul and strength and thy neighbor is thyself. On these two commands hang everything. And in a way, you could say that Tolkien agrees with that completely in Lord of the Rings. Only goodness is stronger than the power of the ring. It's the only thing that's stronger than the power of the ring. But it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that in Lewis's story, he decides to go with the edges of devilry and decide just to go with these little small scale things. Like imagine a guy writing a sociological report, which they make a few changes in the report to favor the nice agenda. And he says, well, they were just minor points, but they favored the agenda of this group. And so he begins to lose his integrity. And then to write the story about the riot before the riot even happened, to justify strengthening the police force against which the nice wants, because they don't want anybody to bother them, because they're doing these evil things. And they've even already arranged for two murders. So they've got that to protect, too. And we don't know that Mark really knows that these guys have been murdered, but he suspects they have. And yet he doesn't inquire to find out, because he doesn't want to make them think that he doesn't trust them. It's, it, Lewis does a lot of subtle things there that make it really good. Anybody else? Byron is next, and this will be our last question, I think. Uh, thank you, and um, thank you for your comments and your insight and perspectives. I wanted to ask uh, a question uh, somewhat related maybe to the question about uh, lack of women's representation in this story. I, both of these, Narnia and Lord of the Rings, are presented as universal, uh, and I'm wondering about the ways in which they don't represent things well whether it's uh, representing women or mental illness. My question is, um, to what extent are, is Lord of the Rings or Narnia a very white story? All, either the Telmarines in Narnia are represented poorly, or the Easterlings or the Orcs, all of the dark-skinned people, are always the bad guys. Now, in what way do they both relate to each other, like Lord of the Rings and the Chronicles of Narnia? Well, how are, how are these comments on skin color and race uh how do, how does that make these stories accessible yeah well it, yeah it, it, the uh, the their ability to be accessible to us in terms of uh, our identity our own personal identities of course it is true that lord of the rings uh, you may not be able to relate to a dwarf the dwarfs you may not be able to relate to elves because they are eternal uh, but and so in a way they become like almost analogous and so you, they're alongside and you learn from what you learn about the character decisions they're making and in chronicles of narnia of course they're just these english children and then the wonderful creatures they meet who also think and relate and that's what makes the, the chronicles of narnia work now lewis uh, by bringing the children into narnia gets criticized by some pure myths 
uh, mythic uh, writers saying, hey, you shouldn't have bring those children in. And, and But, you know, I think Lewis did the right thing. He did it. He, he, had a, he was so deeply impressed by Tolkien's work that you can't, he can never get rid of, of the influence of Tolkien on Lewis. But yet he decides to bring the children in to Narnia. And, uh, but his, uh, Tolkien is wrong when he says that he felt Lewis was uh, uh, writing allegorically there in, in, in the Narnia tale. Lewis is not. Lewis says, I only said this. Given a place like Narnia, I wondered what the Redeemer would be like. And I wondered what, what human beings, how they would act, given a place like Narnia. And that, that's what he does. And th so there are limitations there. Uh, and in a way, you have to do the same thing with Mark Twain. Given a place like the Mississippi River, in the time that Mark Twain wrote, how would this boy act? And what would he, what would he decide? And how would he decide it? Given what he is now a part of. And you have to do that in fairness to every story. You have to do it with Shakespeare. Given a place like the, the century he writes in, how would King Lear act? And what would he, how would he handle the rivals to his power? And I think great stories can teach us, and they kind of are cross, uh, they're, they're transsexual, they're transnational, uh, uh, and, and they work that way. Wow, and now, uh, you know, I did come, use up my time because we wanted to end exactly at noon, and we did, or five to noon. And I'm going to ask uh, my good friend, uh, Paul, Paul Lang, to give us our closing prayer. Uh, could we all stand, please? Uh, I've had the privilege of the, of the closing prayer and possibly a song. O oh God, our creator and sustainer. After events like this, we sometimes pray without knowing why, and often ritualistically in thanksgiving and request. In thanksgiving for time together, the speaker of the message, and in request that we learn, what we learn will move us to, um, to, amp to amplified thought and action. And so also now, O Lord, but more mindfully and fervently, especially in these times, thank you for this day together and for Earl and for what he did presently and in the 62 years of his ministry, strengthening us in our faith journeys with expository accounts of scripture, demonstrating its rationality, stimulating our intellect and interest winning us over yet again to a love of the world and emboldening us further to trust that downhill ski. And thank you also for his insightful past commentaries of his Christian apolog apologistic uh, heroes such as Chesterton, Bart, Bonhoeffer, Sayers, and today for his other major heroes, Lewis and Tolkien. We are grateful for his account of the lives and me messages of these two mas magnificent modern writers. How, then as now, when humanism, with its swagger and hubris, again sinks into tribalism, with its meaningless, with its mean spiritlessness and ridicule of justice and goodness. These heroes remind us and magnify the fact that ultimate goodness comes not from homo sapiens, but from the gifts of grace and omago Dei. And in thanking you for all this, we make the request. In the name of part of you we call your son, who added new understanding to the meaning of grace. Help us to remember this teaching and recite with new vitality the psalm of the ancient writer. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right temperament within me. Do not allow me to drift away from your presence or from your Holy Spirit. Restore in me the joy of your salvation, your grace, and renew a proper fire within me. Amen.